Hello, ladies, how are you? I feel very loud. Oh, that's better. Um, welcome. We are in Matthew 27, which is hard to believe. We are one week from being finished, our, our year-long study on Matthew, which is remarkable. Um, so we're going to dive in here and get started. As many of you know, um, writing and teaching about the Bible has become my, um, my life's work basically, and it is second only to being a wife and a mother. Studying the Bible and sharing what I learn brings me such great joy, and it's been a privilege to do what God has both called me and equipped me to do. But there is one topic which is presented in all four Gospels that shatters my heart every time I read it, and that is the topic of Jesus's crucifixion. And when I realized a while ago I was going to have to share about this today, I'll be honest, I really wasn't looking forward to it. I despise torture. I'm the kind of person in a movie, if that comes up, I will walk out of the movie theater because I can't stand torture. So teaching about Jesus Christ, my precious Lord and Savior, enduring the most horrific death I can imagine was not something I was excited about sharing. But as I began to pray over it, God showed me something new, which I really love this when it happens. And what he brought to my recollection was a verse from Galatians 2.20, which says, I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. And see, this verse gave me a whole new perspective regarding our text today from Matthew 27. God certainly wants me to remember and wants all of us to remember how excruciating it was for him to die on the cross. But he also wanted me to consider my response to what he had endured, to ponder what my life looks like because of his death. So I asked myself, do I live the crucified life with Christ? So I want to share with you a quote from A.W. Tozier. And he said, if a man is truly crucified with Christ, his life will reflect three things. One, he faces only one direction. And if you consider actually being on a literal cross, you can only look one direction. And this means he doesn't look behind him to the past. He only looks forward to the future. The second thing A.W. Tozier said was, he's not going back, right? Once you're crucified, there's no going back to the old life. It means that he's no longer going to the former life. All of that is over and finished, done. And third, he has no future plans of his own. He's died to his own desires. God determines the future, and eternity is always in his focus. I thought that was such a powerful quote by A.W. Tozier. But then I had to ask myself, do I live this way? I kept this question in mind as I began studying Matthew 27, and I ruminated on it as I was studying. And remarkably, what I found that the text we're about to study gives key insights on how to live the crucified life. God never fails to surprise me, and I love it when this happens. This showed up out of nowhere. I have never seen what I'm going to share with you today, these two texts on top of one another like this before. I've never considered these alongside of each other. And so I'm going to use Galatians 2.20 as the headings over Matthew 27. And it's going to look a little bit like this, and it's on your handout. Hopefully you were able to download that um, or get it from your small group leader. And it looks like this. So those, those three points by A.W. Tozier say, I he, so he, number one, he faces in one direction, and that goes under I have been. And we're going to put verses 20, or 1 through 34 of Matthew 27 underneath that heading. Then we're going to say, he's not going back, right? And that's the crucified with Christ phrase. And still under that, he's not going back. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. That's under that he's not going back. And then that final chunk is he has no further plans of his own. And that's the section of um, Galatians where we're going to see, and the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. And then we're going to put that Matthew 27, 57 to 66 underneath that heading. And so that's going to be our breakdown. That's where we're going this morning. And so Matthew 27 will give us the gruesome account of Jesus' death, which should ever remain a reminder that nothing we will ever do or give up 
will ever compare to what he has done for us. But we have a response to his sacrifice, and it's vitally important. Will we crucify our flesh by putting to death our sinful ways and live by faith in the one who loved us and gave himself for us? That's my challenge as we open up this morning, this chapter in Matthew. So let's take a a few minutes, think about that. Let's pray and then dive in and see what the Holy Spirit reveals to us from Matthew 27. Lord Jesus, I praise you and I thank you, God, for this day. I thank you, Father, that even amidst odd and unusual times where the sanctuary is still empty, but you are here and you are with the women who are watching this at home. Lord, you know who they are. You know their circumstances. You know their heart's desires. You know their heart toward you. And Lord, I ask that your Holy Spirit would reveal to them the way you revealed to me new things from a familiar text. This is familiar territory for many of us. And yet, you have shown and revealed things to me I've never seen before. So Holy Spirit, I ask that you would now move through me. Use my mouth, God, to explain the details that you showed me out of this text that I've never seen. And God will be careful to praise you and thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, so let's dive in. We're going to read the first 10 verses out of 27 together, and then we're going to make some connections. All right, so when the morning came, all of the chief priests and the elders and all the people plotted against Jesus to put him to death. And when they had bound him, they led him away and delivered him to Pontius Pilate, the governor. Then Judas, his betrayer, seeing that he had, um, that he had been condemned, was remorseful and brought back 30 pieces of silver to the chief priests and elders, saying, I have sinned by betraying innocent blood. And they said, what is that to us? You see to it. And then he threw down the pieces of silver in the temple and departed and went and hanged himself. But the chief priests took the silver pieces and said, it is not lawful for us to put them into the treasury because they are the price They are the price of blood. And then they consulted together and brought with them, bought with them the potter's field to bury strangers in. And therefore that field has been called the field of blood to this day. Then was fulfilled what was spoken by Jeremiah the prophet saying, and they took that, they took the 30 pieces of silver and value, the value of him who was priced, whom they of the children of Israel priced and gave them for the potter's field as the Lord directed me. Okay, so you're going to see here, we're going to, there's going to be a timeline, if you will, and it's on your handout for you of the events of this chapter and how they unfold. It's believed around 6 a.m. And there's, a, like I said, it looks like an arrow almost of a timeline on your handout. At 6 a.m., we see that he goes, Jesus, they bound Jesus and they take him to Pilate. And the religious leaders had to take him to Pilate because they could not put Jesus to death without the approval of the Roman government. But notice, Jesus allows himself to be delivered to Pilate. It's a choice that he makes. At any point, he could have knocked them over. He could have knocked them straight down like he did in the Garden of Gethsemane that John in chapter 18 describes for us. But instead, Jesus obeyed his father and permitted himself to be bound and led away. And so then we move from those first, just this first handful, I mean, one, of, one or two verses, right? We move right into going back to where Marie left us last week, where Matthew then takes us to this section of the story of what happened to Judas, right? We left him in the garden when he had betrayed Jesus, and now we pick up with that in verse 3. It tells us that Judas was remorseful because he had betrayed innocent blood. Okay, he wanted to rid his guilty, guilty conscious, conscious, but... He went to the wrong place because Judas failed to realize the difference between remorse and godly repentance. There's a very big difference between those two things. Remorse acknowledges guilt, right? Godly repentance acknowledges sin. The sin we committed was first and foremost against God. When Judas went to the Jewish leadership and returned the money, he demonstrated remorse not godly repentance. And perhaps he thought that the leadership would forgive him and ease his guilty conscience, but they did not. Their their callousness and cold-heartedness is remarkable to me. No one can remove our guilt but God alone. 
I love how Marie reminded us last week that Jesus gave Judas many opportunities to turn from his sin and repent, but sadly, he did not. Judas leaves the temple with empty hands, right? He's given that money back, but he also goes back with a guilty heart. Unwilling to turn to Christ with all hope lost, he commits suicide. Oh, how this scene crushes me. There's so much sadness in this chapter. And because our time is limited today, I cannot get into the subject of suicide the way I wish I could. But I would be so remiss if I did not at least touch on it, even if briefly this morning. As a woman who has struggled with depression most of my adult life, may I just say, if you have suicidal thoughts, please understand where those thoughts come from. They come from Satan himself. Luke 22, 3 tells us, then Satan entered Judas. And John 10, 10 tells us that the enemy comes to steal, kill, rob, destroy. Therefore, thoughts of death are not from God, but from Satan. Now, the good news is this. If you're a born-again believer in Jesus, Satan cannot possess you like he did Judas because you are sealed with the Holy Spirit. But he can certainly oppress you, and he has certainly done that many times over my life. However, because of my experiences with suicidal thoughts, two years ago, I spoke on the topic of fear, anxiety, depression, and suicide at Moms in Christ. The teaching link is on your handout, and it's found under the Moms in Christ link here at the Calvary Chapel Chester Springs website. If you are struggling in this area, I encourage you to listen to that teaching. I give some very specific ways on how to combat the enemy. Additionally, if you have these thoughts, please reach out to someone that you know and trust, or you are welcome to reach out to me. I have put my email on your handout for you. Please reach out. I want you to know you're not alone, and that's why I tell you, if you can't find someone that you trust, reach out to me, because there is one thing. I can sympathize with those thoughts, and I encourage you to listen to the teaching I gave, but if you also want additional help, reach out to us. You are not alone. And don't let the enemy win like he did with Judas. All right, we got to move on. There's more I'd like to say about that. If we had more time, I would. But unfortunately, we we have a lot of ground to cover this morning. So we're going to jump back into our text now. Let's go to chapter 27, 11 to 25. Now Jesus stood before the governor. And the governor asked him, saying, Are you the king of the Jews? And Jesus said to him, It is as you say. And while he was being accused by the chief priests and elders, he answered nothing. Then Pilate said to him, Do you not hear how many things they testify against you? But he answered him, Not one word, so that the governor marveled greatly. Now at the feast, the governor was accustomed to releasing to the multitude one prisoner whom they wished. And At that time, there was a notorious prisoner called Barabbas. Therefore, when they had gathered together, Pilate said to them, Who do you want me to release to you, Barabbas or Jesus, who is called Christ? For he knew that they had handed him over because of envy. And while he was sitting on the judgment seat, his wife sent to him, saying, Have nothing to do with this just man, for I have suffered many things today in a dream because of him. But the chief priests and elders persuaded the multitudes that they should ask for Barabbas and destroy Jesus. The governor answered and said to them, which of the two do you want me to release to you? They said, Barabbas. Pilate said to them, what then shall I do with Jesus who is called the Christ? They all said to him, let him be crucified. Then the governor said, why, what evil has he done? But they cried out all the more saying, let him be crucified. And when Pilate saw that he could not prevail at all, but rather that a tumult was rising, he took water and washed his hands before the multitude, saying, I am innocent of the blood of this just person. You see to it. And all the people answered and said, His blood be on us and our children. 
Now we jump back into Jesus' sentencing before Pilate. The only charge that Jesus acknowledges is that he is in fact king of the Jews. But this charge had implications both religiously and politically because both imply sedition. The Jewish leadership wanted it to seem as though Jesus might lead a rebellion against Rome and therefore he deserved to die. And interestingly, Jesus does not defend himself. And this causes Pilate to marvel greatly. Yet it certainly appears that Pilate looks for a way to release Jesus. He recognizes that the leadership is envious, right? And yet Pilate has found no wrongdoing. Pilate's wife even encourages him to have nothing to do with this just man. And so Pilate offers up the release of Jesus in exchange for the death of Barabbas. Barabbas was this notorious insurrectionist murderer. And yet the multitudes cry to have him released instead of Jesus. And Pilate asks again, what evil has he done But when the crowd starts to get crazy and out of control, Pilate responds by washing his hands and saying, he's innocent of Jesus' blood. But catch what the crowd replies with. His blood be on us and our children. (sighs) That statement is so laced with irony. They should not want the blood of Jesus upon them unless it was for the cleansing of their sins. But that is not what they're asking for. And Pilate eventually relents and hands Jesus over to them to be crucified. Let's continue on in this narrative and keep going now in verse 26. Then he releases Barabbas to them. And when he had scourged Jesus, he delivered him to be crucified. And then the soldiers of the governor took Jesus into the praetorium and gathered the whole garrison around him. And they stripped him and they put a scarlet robe on him. And when they had twisted a crown of thorns, they put it on his head and a reed in his right hand. And they bowed the knee before him and mocked him, saying, Hail, King of the Jews. And then they spat on him. They took a reed and they struck his head. And when they mocked him, they took, a robe off, they took the robe off him and put on his own clothes and led him away to be crucified. Now as they came out, they found a man of Cyrene, Simon, by the name. Him they compelled to bear his cross And when they had come to the place called Golgotha, that is to say, the place of the skull, they gave him sour wine mingled with gall to drink. And when he had tasted it, he would not drink it. Um, I just realized I probably should have advanced this PowerPoint, but I'll get there in one second. Um, So thank you. (laughs) Stacy's with me today. I'm very grateful for her. She brought me a Kleenex, my buddy. Um, All right. So... These are some of the worst verses in all of the Bible to me. The treatment of Jesus, the one who came to save us, was brutalized. It makes me physically ill. I actually have a visceral reaction that happens within my body when I read these verses. And when I consider humanity behaving at its worst, torturing Jesus, it sickens me. His skin was ripped clear to the bone during his flogging, which likely meant that his wounds were so deep that it left some of his organs exposed. Yet while reading about this unfathomable pain that he must have been in, God reminded me of something so important. Jesus allowed himself to be in a vulnerable place, be viciously attacked by soldiers who wrongly believed that they were beating just another insurrectionist who thought he was a king. But the truth is, he was then and he still is now the king of kings and Lord of Lords. Check out something so cool that the Lord reminded me of in Revelation 19, 11 to 16, and I believe I put it on your handout for you. Um, I know I've taken you to Revelation before, but I gotta take you to this scripture just for a minute because this parallel is so good. You can't miss it. And the details are in a chart on your handout for you. This is where I wanted to go to the next PowerPoint. Okay, so Listen to these verses from Revelation. Now I saw heaven opened and behold a white horse and he who sat on him was called faithful and true and in righteousness he judges and makes war. His eyes were like a flame of fire and on his head were many crowns and he had the name that no one knew except himself and he was clothed in a robe dipped with blood and his name is called the word of God and the armies of heaven clothed in fine linen white and clean, followed him on white horses. And now out of his mouth goes a sharp sword. And that with it, 
He should strike the nations, and he himself will rule them with a rod of iron. He himself treads on the winepress and of the fierceness and the wrath of Almighty God. And he has on his, na- uh, his robe and on his thigh a name written, King of kings and Lord of lords. Girls, when I got to this section, I literally, I was covered with goosebumps. I was so amazed at what God showed me. Take a look at this chart for one second. On one side, you see Matthew, and you see Jesus. Jesus in this most vulnerable position, right? Where you just want to say, just if I were there, I would just stop, stop. You're you're hurting an innocent man who loves you, right? And here he is being the garrison of men that are there. In ten, there's that's about 10 to 16 men, they're there. But when he returns, he brings with him the armies of heaven, right? No 10 to 16 guys coming with him. Oh no, he's coming back with the armies of heaven. Scarlet robe. When he returns, his robe's gonna be dipped in blood. That crown of thorns he's wearing, he's going to be wearing many crowns when he returns. The reed in his hand, he's going to rule with a rod of iron. They mocked his name, calling him the king of the Jews. Oh, when he comes back, he's faithful and true. He is the word of God. He is king of kings and lord of lords. They struck him and he will strike the nations. I remember this, this part when I was reminded of Jesus being mistreated and mocked and beaten and spit upon and scorned. This was a choice he made because he loved us. He wanted to be our substitute for sin. He could have stopped it at any moment. See, but this is his strength. This is his strength demonstrated by being weak. He was so strong. And one day he will return in full power and full strength and every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that he is Jesus Christ, Lord of Lords. And that realization brought me such comfort when I read this account, I dislike so much. He was not weak. He was strong. He was holding back his strength in order to stand in our place. Jesus first had to come as the suffering servant, according to Isaiah 53. But someday he will return as our conquering Messiah and King, Revelation 19. So I got super pumped up when I got there and that helped me tremendously to get through this part because this is like, to me, some of the worst verses in all of the Bible. So it was like, God was like, that was my choice. I did that because I loved you and I didn't want you to have to endure what I would endure in your place. So precious to me, so precious to me. I'll never read those verses again that I don't think of Revelation 19. Okay, so they led Jesus out to the place called the skull. And um, we have a picture like this hanging in our church. It's, um, it's in Israel. It's the garden tomb. And um, it's where they believe, possibly, that this was where Jesus was crucified. But because Jesus was both fully God and fully man, the violent abuse that his body had endured left him unable to carry the cross. Therefore, they compelled a man named Simon to carry the cross for him. And Simon is a reminder to us that we should have been the ones carrying our own crosses to Golgotha. Jesus offers, is offered a narcotic drink made of wine and gall before they crucify him. Yet Jesus refused to drink it. I got to tell you, I, this, if ever there was a man, a manly man thing to do, you know, we don't have a mamsy, pamsy Jesus. We have a man Jesus. He didn't even take that drink when he could have to lessen the pain. He's like, nope, I'm taking this thing full on. I want to be fully aware as much as possible of the penalty that I'm taking on behalf of the people I love. And as I considered these 34 verses... I see myself as what I have been. And this is on your handout for you. See, I too am the reason that Jesus had to be crucified. I have been the betrayer looking to clear my conscience like Judas. I have been the accuser like the chief priests and the elders. I have been the coward like Pilate. I have been the murderer, insurrectionist, robber like Barabbas. I was the humiliator, mocker, and abuser like the soldiers. I was the forced and unprepared worker like Simon. I am a sinner in need of a faultless savior. And for all of these reasons, I deserve to die. 
So I have a decision to make. Will I lay down my life and allow it to be crucified by putting my sins to death with Jesus Christ? Let's take a look at what it cost Jesus. Let's go now to do that in our place. Let's go now to Matthew 27, 35. Then they crucified him and divided his garments, casting lots, that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the prophet. They divided my garments among them, and for my clothing they cast lots. Sitting down, they kept watch over him there, and they put up over his head the accusation written against him, this is Jesus, the king of the Jews. Then two robbers were crucified with him, one on the right and another on the left. And those who passed by blasphemed him, wagging their heads and saying, you who destroy the temple and build it up in three days, save yourself. If you are the son of God, come down from the cross. Likewise, the chief priests also mocking with the scribes and the elders said, he saved others. Himself, he cannot save. He is the king of Israel. Let him now come down from the cross and we will believe him. He trusted in God. Let him deliver him now, if he will have him. For he said, I am the son of God. Even the robbers who were crucified with him reviled him with the same thing. Now from the sixth hour until the ninth hour, there was darkness over all the land. And at the ninth hour, Jesus cried out with a loud voice saying, Eli, Eli, Luma, Sabachthani. That is, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Some of those who stood near when they heard that said, this man is calling for Elijah. Immediately, one of them ran and took a sponge, filled it with sour wine and put it on a reed and offered it to him to drink. And the rest said, let him alone. Let's see if Elijah will come and save him. And Jesus cried out again with a loud voice and yielded up his spirit. So according to that timeline I gave you in the beginning, it's about 9 a.m. when Jesus' crucifixion begins. And the verses we just read chronicle the events of the six hours which he hung on the cross. The soldiers cast lot for his, lots for his clothes and the sign that hung above his head Stating the charge that was brought against him, this is Jesus, King of the Jews. Some of the people mocked him, daring him to demonstrate his deity and power. Then even the two thieves reviled him. Interestingly, they came by and they said, bring yourself down if you're the son of God. And yet, had he done that, had he brought himself down, he couldn't save us. So he left himself there. And from noon till three, Matthew tells us it's the sixth hour to the ninth hour, which is noon to three, darkness covered the land. An interesting point with that that I thought was when Jesus came to earth, right, what hailed his arrival? Light, right? Light hailed his, his arrival. And when he died, what hailed that? Darkness. Such an interesting parallel. And then right before Jesus dies, he quotes Psalm 22, 1. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? See, God the Father had to withdraw from the Son. Jesus had endured physical pain up till this point, but now he's experiencing spiritual pain. He and the Father had been united during Jesus' time on earth. And yet in this moment, because Jesus had to pay the penalty for sin, which is separation from God, a holy transaction takes place. God the Father regarded God the Son as if he were a sinner. Have you ever noticed that third, verse 35 simply said, then they crucified him? The text does not go into the naked humiliation, the brutality of the nails going through skin, muscle, and bone, the suffocation, the undiluted brutality and indescribable pain that he endured for six hours. So much happened during that time. But for our purposes this morning, I want to take a few moments and share just two, some thoughts on just two of the objects regarding Jesus' crucifixion. And that's the nails and the cross and what they mean to a believer. I brought with me, and if you've been with us for any length of time, you've probably seen me show this before, a Roman nail. Um, it's just, just even the look of it, to think of that piercing skin and what that would do. I mean, I, I got a splinter and I'm like in tears, right? And it's like you put this through skin, through, you know, bone, through tissue. Same thing with feet. 
I mean, just the thought of that, right? That's, that's a Roman nail. But if you consider for a second what regular nails in our world today, they're a lot smaller, um, regular nails, if we think about those for a second, what are these used for? What do we use nails for? Well, typically we use them to fix something that's broken, right? Or hold something in place. But if we apply this analogy to Christ being nailed to the cross for us, it accomplishes both of those things. It fixes something very broken, our sin problem. And it repairs our broken sin nature forever, holding it, our forgiveness, holding our forgiveness in place. Isaiah 53, 5 and 6 tells us this about the nails. He was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was upon him. And by his wounds, we are healed. We all, like sheep, have gone astray, each of us turning his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. And so if we looked at the nails as not an instrument for death, right? Not so tiny either. We look at this nail as an instrument of death, Instead of looking at it like that, if we saw it as a symbol, right, of how Jesus, the carpenter, I love that, from Nazareth, solved our sin problem once and for all. And then we have the other thing I wanted to talk about, which is the cross. And the cross, it's a horrible symbol of shame. It was so offensive to a Roman person that they refused to even permit Roman citizens to be crucified, no matter what they had done. And Cicero, who's a Roman narrator, said this, let the very mention of a cross be far removed, not only from any Roman citizen's body, but from his mind, his eyes, and his ears. That's how detestable the cross was. Yet today, we wear crosses as jewelry, we put them on our grave sites, we adorn our walls of churches with them. How did such a symbol become such, like uh, this symbol, become such a symbol of shame? I mean, it was such a symbol of shame, become such a symbol of hope. How did that, when did that change? Why did it change? Well, Colossians 13 and 14 tells us why. Having forgiven all of your trespasses, having wiped out the handwriting of requirements that was against us, which is contrary to us. And then he had taken it out of the way, having nailed it to the cross, having disarmed principalities and powers, he made a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them. See, the cross, which was such a um, sign of scorn and shame, became a symbol for us as believers, as celebration, a time of gratitude, represents life and victory over death. Right? And we, if we accept Jesus' payment on the cross for us, if we accept that and say, I believe it, I believe you paid the penalty for me, then we are crucified with Christ. And therefore, this no longer, these nails, we don't see them as instruments of death. We don't see the cross as an instrument of death. No, instead we say, oh no, these things are are victorious. These items, the, Jesus is victorious, but the items that were used represent victory to us. And we can say, I have been crucified with Christ. It's no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me, right? That's the crucifixion. Oops, there goes my nail. My powerful visual here. Hold on a second. Let me try again. We say, I'm crucified with Christ. I'm willing to lay down my my sin and my shame and say, I identify with you, Jesus. I want to crucify my flesh from here forward. That's what you're saying to him. And on your handout, you'll see, I made this, I went from black, right? So that's sin into I'm crucified with Christ. And it says, if I'm crucified with Christ, I identify with Christ in his suffering. I put to death my sin through Jesus and saying with Christ, this is finished. This part of my life is over. It's done. It's finished. I don't want to go back to it anymore. I am crucified with Christ. That's what you're saying. And once we make this decision, we are to do our best to turn from our sin and no longer live in it. Spurgeon gave a great perspective on this and why we should desire to crucify our sin. He said to this, knowing the agony the son of God experienced on the cross, it should affect how we see sin. Our, oh sirs, this is, you know, remember this is Spurgeon, so this was a while ago. Oh sirs, if I had a dear brother who had been murdered, 
What would you think of me if I valued the knife which had crimsoned his blood? If I made friends of the murderer and daily consorted with the assassin who drove the dagger into my brother's heart, surely I too must be an accomplice to the crime. Sin murdered Christ. Will you be a friend to it? Sin pierced the heart of the incarnate God. Can you love it? May the power of the Holy Spirit keep us from consorting with the enemy. And may we never take lightly our sin, knowing what it cost Christ. Let's go to our second to last section. We're going to go 51 to 56 now. Then behold, the veil of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom and the earth quaked and the rocks were split and the graves were opened and many bodies of the saints who had fallen asleep were raised and coming out of the graves after the resurrection, they went into the holy city and appeared to many. So when the centurion and those with him who were guarding Jesus saw the earthquake and the things they had happened, they feared greatly saying, truly, this was the son of God. And many women who followed Jesus from Galilee, ministering to him, were there, looking on from afar, among whom were Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James and Joseph, and the mother of Zebedee's sons. Um, Many years ago, my sister-in-law went to see The Passion of the Christ, um, which was directed by Mel Gibson, and she was saved through watching that movie. The next day, when I saw it for myself, I specifically remember When Jesus finally gave up his spirit, which we just read, I felt like a deep sense of relief sort of wash over me. It was like, okay, the pain is over. The hardest part is finished. And it was because I knew what was coming next. I could finally, like in my movie seat, I was just like, okay, all right, we got through the worst of it, right? And I couldn't wait for now the next section to come. And that's kind of how I feel. Like Stacey's going to get into this next week in, in chapter 28. But even now, when I look at this next section of what happens, it's like hope begins to rise, right? And, and excitement starts to build because the tough part's over and the good stuff's coming. And my heart says, here we go, let's see. And so we see the veil rip and it's torn from top to bottom. This is such a symbolic event. The veil was mostly blue. You have to understand, it was 60 feet, up. this is what they said, this is the, 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 the dimensions of it, about 60 feet tall, 30 feet wide and four to six inches thick. Okay, imagine the sound that that would cause when it rips. I'm just thinking about, I mean, I can't even, I can't even comprehend what it must have sounded like. And for, you, know, be, you can't even imagine, like, anybody even thinking a human could do such a thing, right? To just rip it, and not from the bottom to the top, from the top to the bottom. And it just, the, that, that splitting was God-ordained. And it meant that we had direct access to God. No longer is there anything between us and him causing a barrier for us not to be en- be able to enter the Holy of Holies. You know, I love that Hebrews 10, 19 and 20 tells us this. It says, actually, I'm only going to give you 19. But therefore, brethren, having boldness to enter the holy, holiest by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way, he consecrated it for us through the veil. That is his flesh, his flesh ripped and so So did the veil. No more barriers in the way. All can enter the Holy of Holies. No longer just the high priest gets to experience Jesus, or well, God in that place, but now Jesus too, right? No longer is it just the high priest. No more need for blood sacrifices. No more mediator between man and God. All can enjoy the presence of God. And the earth shakes and the rocks split and tombs are opened. Now, you got to wonder what in the world that looked like. I, 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 can't even, I can't even imagine. But the dead were raised up. That's what it tells us. Um, likely those being described were people who had died and were held, like died in faith and were held in Abraham's bosom. That is what's believed. And their bodies and their spirits were reconnected. And Jesus had, because Jesus had conquered death, 
this was sort of like a preview of the resurrection to come when our bodies, if we die before Christ returns, our bodies and our spirits will be rejoined. And you know, people wonder like, oh, well, what will that look like? You know, just think Lazarus, right? His body and his spirit had been separated for three days, right? Or yeah, it was three days, right? That they were separated. They were brought back together when Jesus came and, and resurrected Lazarus. Lazarus didn't look any different. He didn't look like a zombie when he came back. He looked like Lazarus. They all identified him. They knew who he was. It's not like you're going to come back in some weird zombie format. You're going to come back looking like a human, just like, you know, so that, so people wonder, what did that look like when, when those bodies were raised? I believe they looked just like people walking around. Anyway, additionally, it is likely that we've just read about the first convert too, which is so powerful, right? Jesus dies, all this stuff happens. And the centurion, this hardened dude who watches people crucified all the time, turns and says, surely this must have been the son of God. He's an example of those of us who accept the sacrifice and acknowledge the work of the cross and say to themselves, what do they say? They say, I no longer live, but it's Christ who lives in me. This powerful change occurs. Once we say, I will be crucified with Christ. It's no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. This change occurs. And once we die to self and accept the substitution of Jesus Christ as our, our savior, our payment for sin, we are given the power of the Holy Spirit. And God is no longer in that situation. God no longer was with them. He is in them and he's in us, right? It's such a cool transaction that occurs that's just like none other. Anyways, we got to go on. So now we're going to go to Matthew 27, 57 to the end, to 66. Now, when evening had come, there was a rich, name from Ar- a rich man from Arimathea named Joseph, who himself had also become a disciple of Jesus. This man went to Pilate and asked for the body of Jesus. And then ba- Pilate commanded the body to be given to him. When Jesus had taken the body, he wrapped it in clean linen cloth and laid it in a new tomb, which he had hewn out of a rock. And he rolled a large stone against the door of the tomb and departed. And Mary Magdalene was there, and the other Mary sitting opposite the tomb. On the next day, which followed, the day of preparation, the chief priests and the Pharisees gathered together to Pilate, saying, Sir, we remember while he was still alive how that deceiver said, After three days I will rise. Therefore, command that the tomb be made secure until the third day, lest the disciples come by night and steal the body away, or steal him away, and say to the people, He has risen from the dead, so that the last deception will be worse than the first. And Pilate said to them, You have a, um, you have a guard, go your way, make it as secure as you know how. I love that. Make it as secure as you know how. It's almost like Pilate's like, Yeah, if he really is who he says he is, yeah, you go ahead. You put the guard up. Go ahead, seal it. Have fun with that. It's not going to do you any good, but go ahead. And so they went and made the tomb secure, sealing the stone and setting the guard. All right. So I do have to. Just, I don't have this in my notes, but I do just want to say this one other thing really quick. In sixty-six, do you notice that they seal the stone? If you go to Revelation, we're in Revelation on Sunday morning. I'm seeing all these parallels with Revelation, and and we've been commenting about this a lot as a, the delighting in the Lord team. We've been saying like, isn't it cool to see all these like overlays? If you go to Revelation five, the question is raised: Who can like break the seal? Who can break the seal? Well. He already broke the seal. He broke his own seal right here right in the tomb. Isn't that cool? Like I didn't have that. I was, was going to skip that, but it's too good to miss. He's the one who can, can break the seals. He is the only one. And he broke the first one right here. Anyway, all right, moving on. All right, so this text, we find two choices here that are made in response to Jesus' crucifixion. First, let us look at the religious leadership's response. They doubt his words. They call him a deceiver. And they try to stop his power. So this is one response to Jesus's crucifixion, rejection. But there's a second response. And that's the one that accepts Christ. Joseph of Arimathea is a great example of someone who chooses the crucified life. He is known as a disciple of Christ. He identifies with Christ despite what it may do to his, his personal reputation among his colleagues in the Sanhedrin. He's more courageous than even the, Jesus' own disciples who were hiding and fearful at that time. Joseph asks Pilate for Jesus' body and then puts Jesus in his personal 
tomb. Okay, I couldn't get past this. This is so cool. He treats Jesus as if he was family, right? This was a family tomb, they believed. This was a family tomb for him. And so he takes Jesus and puts him in his family tomb. He treats him like a king. He takes spices. John tells us 100 pounds, the amount that's used to bury a king in the Old Testament, wraps him in linen and demonstrates love toward him. Perhaps it was that Joseph realized by putting his faith in Jesus, he had become part of Jesus' family too, the family of God. Joseph treasured Christ as all of us should who are truly crucified with him. And so our last PowerPoint says this, and the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. And this brings us to Joseph, because I think he's a great example. He's courageous. He's a disciple. He puts Jesus in his tomb. He knows that that's the tomb he belongs in, but his Savior went there for him. Joseph is part of Jesus' family, the family of God. So the last part of Galatians 2.20 says, the son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. This is where I want to just pause. You know, I, I, because of the, the seriousness of the text, I didn't spend a lot of time on this. I just, but I, I, I must just take you here for a few moments. The son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. I said it's a joy before him he endured the cross. Has there ever been anyone like him? Is there any other savior that deserves my life, my love, my worship, my adoration? None that I know. He is Jesus, the one and only, the King of kings and the Lord of lords. The least I can do is crucify myself in response to what he has done for me. And it is out of that love that he did it. You know, Love is one of those things that we have such a superficial understanding of, I believe. It's something else to think. He would lay down his life for me, for you. He loved us that much. There's very few people I would lay my life down for. But I'll tell you what, Jesus laid it down for the worst of sinners, for the worst of people, not even the best of us, the worst of us. He died for us because he loved us that much. That's a love we don't know here, I don't think on earth, outside of knowing Jesus Christ. You can't comprehend how much he loves you until you read this passage and see what he endured because he loves us that much. If you don't know the love of Jesus Christ, may today be the day you find him because the love that will fill you will be like none other you have ever known or ever will. Even the best of loves, it is beyond that. If you don't know him, it is simply only saying to him, forgive me, forgive me for what I have done. I have been Barabbas. I have been the soldiers. I have been the mockers. I have been the Jewish leadership. I have scorned you. I have shamed you. I have rejected you. But no more, no more. I crucify my life with you. I accept that you are my payment for salvation. You are the only one who can because you are sinless. I am not. And so I ask for that holy exchange to occur. And when it does, there's a peace that washes over you that you cannot know, just like Judas never knew it because he didn't go to the right place. There will be a peace that passes all understanding. And if you would just but tell him you are sorry, he will say with the most loving voice you've ever heard, I forgive you. I forgive and then this incredible exchange happens you take your nasty filthy rags of a life 
and you hand them to him and he hands you a white clean linen robe and says you're forgiven. And that stands on your body and covers your sin until the day you see him face to face. If you don't know that kind of love, he's ready and willing to say, come to me, I will forgive you. I pray today is that day for you. And his Holy Spirit will fill you to overflowing and you will overcome and be victorious with him. And these elements we've seen today become symbols of victory and a resurrected life. So what's so good about Good Friday? What's so good about it? Especially considering what we've read today. What's so good about Good Friday? We celebrated Good Friday about almost two weeks ago tomorrow. And I received a text from a friend who's a missionary in Eswatini, which I want to share with you. She sent me this video And her timing couldn't have been more impeccable. I was prepping for this message. I was sitting there in my room, working, reading, and in came this text. And it is this video I want to share with you. We had posted, Stacey had actually posted it to the Delighting in the Lord um, Facebook page. And perhaps you've seen it already. But if you haven't, I want to share this with you now. It's called What's So Good About Good Friday. Good Friday, how can one describe such a day? The wrongdoing of all humanity, putting to an end an innocent man, the Son of God. This is the story of Jesus' death by way of a cross, all in one moment bringing death to the bright light of our future. He never stopped loving us, and yet this is the incredible part of it. Our sin stopped his heart. Our sin drove the nails firmly in the hands of God. All along, these were the plans. We told ourselves that we were in control, and this was deemed sufficient for all of us. The brutal beating, the inhuman flogging, the naked humiliation. Heaven watched and saw it all. Our rebellion, our guilt, our shame, erasing the very notion of reconciling us with God, our sin and our debt, overcoming Jesus. Here is our King, obliterated. The enemy laughing, his plans unstoppable. There's no longer the sound of freedom rising. Now God's people are utterly broken. Behold the chains of mortality. Yes, this is what is true. We had heard the stories of old. The lost are found, the blind can see, the weak are made strong. But now we are witnesses to this reality. God is dead. We'd almost believed there is a way of redemption. There is a life of fulfillment. There is a peace beyond understanding. Now we know better. For us, we can say that God is encapsulated in this one realization. The single greatest sacrifice in human history is finished. How clearly we can see it. So what's so good about Good Friday? just one thing, that the blood of Jesus can reverse the curse of sin and raise the dead to life. How clearly we can see it is finished. The single greatest sacrifice in human history encapsulated in this one realization, we can say that God is for us. Now we know better. There is a peace beyond understanding. There is a life of fulfillment. There is a way of redemption. 
We had almost believed God is dead, but now we are witnesses to this reality. The weak are made strong, the blind can see, the lost are found. We had heard the stories of old, yes, this is what is true. The chains of mortality utterly broken. Behold, freedom rising. Now God's people are unstoppable. There's no longer the sound of the enemy laughing. His plans obliterated. Here is our King, Jesus, overcoming our sin and our debt, reconciling us with God, erasing the very notion of our rebellion, our guilt, our shame. Heaven watched and saw it all, the naked humiliation, the inhuman flogging, the brutal beating, and this was deemed sufficient for all of us. We told ourselves that we were in control. All along, these were the plans firmly in the hands of God. Our sin drove the nails. Our sin stopped his heart. And yet, this is the incredible part of it. He never stopped loving us. The bright light of our future all in one moment, bringing death to death by way of a cross. This is the story of Jesus, the Son of God, an innocent man putting to an end the wrongdoing of all humanity. How can one describe such a day? Good Friday. So what's so good about Good Friday? Just one thing, that the blood of Jesus can reverse the curse of sin and raise the dead to life. So what will our response be? I pray it will be the decision to face one direction. Do not go back. Have no further plans of our own because we have declared, as Galatians 2.20 tells us, I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. The life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Let's pray. Lord, how can we ever tell you thank you enough? There are not enough words in the English language, to say thank you, enough. God, what you endured on our behalf, what we each deserved, you took upon yourself because you loved us just that much. God, how I pray if there is anyone who does not understand or know that love firsthand, oh Lord, how I pray today, they would set that straight with you, that they would walk through the door of salvation today. And God, as we look forward to next week's text, this part is finished. It is over. You will be raised to life. The tomb is empty. You have overcome death in the grave. There is nothing that can stop you. And it is with that joy that we will praise you and thank you for what you have accomplished and worship you all the days that we have left. God, how we declare today, we love you and we thank you for your sacrifice. In Jesus' precious name, amen.